Hello, it's April 18th, 2023. This video is called The Testimony of Jesus. In Revelation 19, verse 10, the angel said to John, The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The first thing I want to talk about is why didn't the angel say the testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy? Why did he say the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy? There's a very good reason why that is the case. I found a uh, interesting article that discusses the use of the word Messiah in the Old Testament. And in the, I'll put a link to this. In the article, he says that the word Messiah, which is the word Christ in the New Testament, um, was used to designate several different classes of people. One of them, one class, uh, was the priests. And um, he points out in Leviticus 4, verse 3, he says, If it is the anointed, or if it is the Mashiach, the Messiah, or Christ, priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, he shall offer for the sin that he has committed, a bull of the herd without blemish, as a sin offering to the Lord. And then uh, later on, there were prophets who were designated as Mashiach. So uh, that referred to, for example, Elisha, whom Elijah anointed, and Elijah was also to anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And the word anoint is Mashiach. And in First Chronicles 16.22, the scripture says, Do not touch my anointed ones. Do not touch my Mashiach, or my Messiah, my Christ. Do my prophets no harm. So the prophets were considered to be anointed ones just as the priests were. And then another example is with respect to the kings. David referred to Saul, who was trying to kill him. Saul was trying to kill David. He said to his men in 1 Samuel 24, verse 6, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, the Lord's Mashiach or the Lord's Messiah, the Lord's Christ, to stretch forth my hand against him. Seeing he is the anointed, or he is the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Christ of the Lord. And so we see that in the Old Testament, there are various references to Messiah. Um, in 1 Kings 1, 38-39, So the priest Zadok, the prophet Nathan, and Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and the Carathites and the Pelathites, went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and led him to Gihon. There the priest Zadok took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed, that is Meshach, or Messiah, Christ, Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. And then a very interesting, very interesting one refers to Cyrus the Great. And um, this is in Isaiah 45, verses 1 through 3. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, Mashiach, or Messiah, Christ, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him and the gates shall not be closed. 
I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. So, it is interesting. This author says Cyrus the Great is the only non-Jewish person in the Bible to be called by this title of anointed one. Another reason why the scripture says the testimony of Jesus and not the testimony of Christ is because it's very common for uh, New Age believers to b believe that they are Christ, that they are part of the Godhead, and um, that they really, that Jesus was no different than them. That's ultimately what it boils down to. And what that means for them is that Jesus has become the stumbling stone because they can't believe in him because they believe that they too are Christ, or at least that they're going to be, that they are ascending. And once fully illuminated, they will be just like Jesus was. Now they have a totally fault, faulty understanding of who Jesus was, and they do not, do not understand his teaching, because if they did, they would understand that that was not what he was saying about himself at all. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When Jesus came, he called himself the Son of of man. That's a very particular phrase. And the reason why he did that was because he was God. He was the creator of man who condescended to come in the flesh and therefore become a son of man in order to save the people that he had created. See, when Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, they were given into the jurisdiction of Satan, and Satan became their ruler, legal ruler. We are taught in the scripture that Jesus redeemed us. That means Jesus bought us from Satan. His blood paid the price for our souls. That's why the scripture also says that we are bond servants of Jesus because he bought us. He paid the price for us. That was done because Jesus, who was God, who came in the flesh, Jesus then was God in the flesh, led a sinless, perfect life, shed his blood for us, and therefore was able to rise again by the power, by his own power take the keys of the kingdom from Satan and also go into heaven, ascend into heaven, and apply his blood to the mercy seat in heaven, the true, actual mercy seat that paid the price for our redemption. That's what it means to be redeemed. That's why we become bondservants. And that's why it's important that we obey Christ the obedience of faith. We, If we really have faith, we're going to obey. Because we, if we really have faith, we're going to understand what it was that Jesus did for us. And that's why the scripture says 
the testimony of Jesus, the man, is the spirit of prophecy. See, there are many people who have been called Christ. And there are going to be many, many more who are called Christ because all of the 144,000 sons of God will be called Christ. Now, it's important to then go to the scriptures to see what the testimony of Jesus is. I think a great place to start that is... Um, well, John chapter 19 is great. 19 verse 35. This is John, the apostle who wrote this. He who saw it, that is, he who saw the soldiers pierce the side of Jesus and saw the blood and the water come out, who saw that Jesus was dead. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. Okay, then let's go to um, Luke chapter 24. Very, very interesting chapter. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the li living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man... The Son of Man, Jesus, a man, must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. The eleven, of course, are the twelve apostles minus Judas. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. So these were the women who went to anoint Jesus' body with spices. So they told these things to the apostles, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. See, the apostles, even at this point, did not believe that Jesus would rise from the dead. It's too much to believe. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, two of who? Two of these disciples, whether they were the uh, of the eleven apostles or some others that were disciples, we don't know. I do not believe they're named Oh yeah, one's a name, Cleva. So these would have been disciples. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. 
Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And the man who was with them said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Well, wouldn't it be nice if the writer of Luke had then written down all these scriptures that Jesus shared with Cleopas and the other man? Well, fortunately, we've got the New English the English Standard Version Reference Edition. And when you look in the Reference Edition to this verse, verse 27, Luke 24, 27, the references include, with regard to the law, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, five or six different scripture passages. And then with respect to the prophets, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen 12, 13, 14, 14 references. So what we're going to do now is look at these references. The first one is Genesis 3.15. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, the Lord appears to them, including Satan. And in 3.14 and 15, it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this is a reference. The seed of the woman is Jesus. The dust that he will eat is us. So Satan was cursed to eat mankind for the duration of his existence here on earth as the ruler of this world. The next reference is Genesis 12, verse 3. And this is a reference to the call of Abram. Now I am said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's referring to Christ, to Jesus, to the man Jesus, who is a descendant of Abram. And this is another one of the scriptures that deals with the fact that Jesus' work and salvation is for all for all the families of the earth. Then in Genesis 22, verse 18. Starting with verse 15. And the angel of I am called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, 
By myself I have sworn, declares I am. Because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring. As the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Now that was the time when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. And that is actually quoted in the book of Hebrews. And it says that the Lord swears, he swore by himself, that he would bless all of the nations of the earth through his seed, who was Jesus. The next one is Numbers 21, verse 9. Numbers 21, verse 9. Interesting passage. This deals with the bronze serpent. I'm going to read from verse 4. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless bread. You know, how many Christians loathe the scriptures, this worthless bread, this, we've heard this all our life, but have they spent time? Have they, have they approached it as if it were the very food of God? We loathe this worthless bread. You know, that's, that's the word of an unbeliever, isn't it? Then I am sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have sinned, for we have spoken against I am and against you. Pray to I am, that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and I am said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. What is that? A pole? A wooden pole? You mean like a cross? A serpent? You mean like becoming sin for us? See, this represents Jesus on the cross. If you look at him, you will live if you look. But how many people despise this worthless bread? How many people go off in their tangents, especially you new age believers who won't take the time to look into the scriptures to see all of the testimony, all of the witness, all of the prophecy the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It prophetically looks forward thousands of years and was accurate. Then, Numbers 24, verse 17. Interesting also, here we're actually into Balaam. Remember Balaam and the churches who fall into the sin of Balaam who is you know, falling into doing the work, supposedly, of God for gain, for money, always having to be paid for your little snippets on the Internet and when you go to conferences and everything like that. So in Numbers 24, 17, this is part of Balaam's final oracle. The oracle, this I'll start with 15, the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. How can you see those things and then have a heart that just wants gain? I, I don't understand. Verse 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. 
A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Okay, that would, the forehead of Moab would foretell the uh, crushing the head of Satan. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also, his enemy, shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly, and one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of cities. So I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. Jacob, of course, is the man who became Israel, the father of the Israelite nation, and the star is Jesus. The testimony of Jesus. And then it's interesting, and this was also referenced in uh, the references in the English Standard Version to uh, John 5, verse 46, which says, If you believed Moses, see, Moses wrote all these books that I just read, Genesis, Numbers, he wrote uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So Jesus said to the Pharisees, Well, the Pharisees, I'm going to read a little bit more than what I just wrote in my notebook because a um, little context here is interesting. So, verse 44 of John 5. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So he's telling the Jews, you have no excuse. You don't even, you say you're the children of Moses. You don't even believe what Moses wrote, he said. Okay, now going to the prophets. We'll start with 2 Samuel chapter 7. Again, all of these are referenced uh, in Luke 24 in the uh, English Standard Version Reference Edition. So, 1 Samuel 7, 12 through 16. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called his name Ebenezer. For he said, Till now I am has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of I am was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities that the Philistines... I'm reading from the wrong... I'm reading 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. I didn't think I was getting to a prophecy of Jesus there. Um, 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16. start reading in verse 4. Or verse 1, 7, 1. Now when the king, King David, lived in his house, and I am had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart for I am is with you. But that same night, the word of I am came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David. Thus says I am, would you build me a house to dwell in? 
I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling in all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel. Did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people and Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says I am of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, I am declares to you, that I am will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me. A son. And so this is speaking prophetically of Jesus who builds the house of God, as we're told in the book of Hebrews. Then Isaiah 7, verse 4. skip that one go to 9 verse 6 very famous scripture made especially famous by Handel's Messiah 9 6 for to us a child is born and to us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So this actually follows on the prophecy to David by Nathan. Then Isaiah 50, verse 6. I just thought there's one that was not referenced by um, the book, and that's um, Psalm 22. And um, Psalm 22. Let's take a look at that before we go to Isaiah. I believe David wrote that, so it would be have been written before Isaiah. So Psalm 22. Yes, it's a Psalm of David. Jesus said this on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? Why are you so far from the words of my groaning? Now what this shows, since Psalm 22 was not even listed in the references in the book, in this book, shows that they didn't didn't give all the references. You can surely find more references to Christ in the scripture than what I'm going through today. But I wanted to show you how you can use this book to get into the spirit of prophecy. 
because this takes you to the testimony of Jesus. Then going down to 22 verse 6, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. See, these um, were quoted in the New Testament. Twelve. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening, roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. That's what happens when you hang on the cross. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Of course, his hands and feet were pierced on the cross. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. This is what John referred to in John chapter 19. He specifically referred to this. And then in 22, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. I will tell of your name to my brothers. Now that brings to mind, I believe it's Isaiah 8. Well, it doesn't, doesn't uh, use the word brothers, but I'm glad I turned to that because this is a verse I wanted to read today. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. I will wait for I am who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom I am has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp and mutter. You know, when they say, go to, go to this fortune teller, go to tarot cards, get a Ouija board, find out what's really going on in the spirit world. No, never do that. Should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. To the law and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it is because they have no light in them. And now let's go to Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. That was fulfilled in the New Testament as we read. Then Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. So this is a long passage here, but we need to read it. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, 
and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of I am been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken. Spitten, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And I am has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Once again, you see that Christ died for all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb, the lamb of God. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, he was crucified on Passover day. Like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man and his death. There again, fulfilling prophecy that a rich man let him be put into his tomb. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, Yet it was the will of I am to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of I am shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. See how the gospel has been told throughout the Old Testament, but the rulers didn't see it. They didn't understand it. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And let's see, let's go to Isaiah 61. Starting with verse 1. Jesus quoted this when he began his ministry. The spirit of the Lord I am is upon me because I am has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of I am, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations." Jesus spoke this word as a saying he was the fulfillment of this prophecy. He stopped in the middle of verse 2 because from then on it's really dealing with the overcomers, the Kodeshim, 
the 144,000 who are going to restore the ancient ruins and build up the devastations of generations. Jeremiah 23. Maybe my favorite chapter in Jeremiah. 23. Verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares I am, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Now here I actually think that this is referring to the Kodeshim. Because for the Kodeshim, the Lord is our righteousness, and we will be the we are the branch. He is the vine, and we are the branches. But that's not understood by many, and that's why it occurs as a reference in the English Standard Version. And then Daniel 7. Very interesting. Verses 13 and 14. Daniel seven thirteen and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, Jesus. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel 9. I'm going to go ahead and skip through, skip that one at this time. Let's go to Micah, Micah 5. Five verse two, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. That was quoted in the New Testament. Zechariah. I'm going to skip that one. And let's see about the next one here. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. We see this in John 12, 15. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, John 12, 15. I'm not remembering why I said that, so let me look at that real quick, because that actually occurs... No, it is. It is here. The triumphal entry. I'm going to read this. Uh, John 12, 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming 
sitting on a donkey's colt. So John quotes that, the fulfillment of the prophecy from Zechariah 9, verse 9. Then uh, 12, Zechariah 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mer mercy, so that when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. As they look upon me whom they have pierced. They pierced his side, remember? John is the one who quotes that, and that was in chapter 19 of John. John states that too. And then a prophecy again concerning the crucifixion of Jesus in Zechariah 13, 7 and 8. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares I am of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. That's what happened. Peter denied him, and the sheep were scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. Then I want to remind you of uh, Acts thirteen twenty seven. This is Paul. Who said he's preaching to uh, Jews in Antioch, and he says, "For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him." nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And finally, I want to uh, go to Acts chapter 8, which is a very interesting story. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, starting in 826. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? You know, do you understand what you're reading? When you read the scripture, it's line upon line, precept upon precept. We have to continue reading in order to understand. <clears throat> Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. And this is actually from Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8, that we just read. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him 
the good news about Jesus. He told him the gospel about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded. So he believed. See, the, the eunuch believed the things that Philip said to him. And so immediately, based upon the scripture, and based upon the testimony, the testimony of the scripture, the testimony of Jesus, he wanted to be baptized. So that's the beginning. It's a step of faith. But it represents being baptized with the word, being washed with the word. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now this is one of the classic scriptures used to show that baptism should be by immersion. And I do agree with that because, see, that shows going down in death, the death of Christ and coming up, being resurrected in the new life. But it also represents the washing of the word. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So those are all of the references that the English Standard Version of the Bible gives. It's so cool. That was in Luke 24, uh, the road to Emmaus. Because Jesus expounded to Cleopas and his companion what was said in the Old Testament concerning him. That's why the scriptures are so powerful. And that's why it, it's really sad that so many people who think that they really understand things spiritually, neglect the eyewitness testimony of Scripture. Prophets were given words by God hundreds of years before Jesus lived. Eyewitnesses testified to what Jesus went through, his life, his ministry, his crucifixion, his appearances after he was resurrected, and then also testify about their walking in the power of the Spirit to preach the Word of God after that. These are eyewitness testimonies. The testimony of the man Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. To prophesy is to speak forth the word of God. And when you take the time to learn the word line upon line, you will be able to prophesy. You will speak forth the word of God. And the speaking forth of the word of God is the testimony of Jesus the man, the stumbling stone, the man in whom God dwelt fully, God on earth who came, who lived, who died for us, for his people, so that we could then live with him, for him, by him. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy.